Hello and welcome to the Safety Goals Podcast with Justin Torres and Charlie One, presented by Injury This is episode four with our special guest, Skip Gilbert. Skip Gilbert is the current CEO of USU Soccer, one of our nation's largest youth sports organization. And it's always exciting and a privilege to be able to talk to these folks who are our national leaders in youth sports. Uh, Skip's got some great uh, uh, ideas about how to change the game of soccer. So real excited to get into the episode. Absolutely right, Charlie. Skip is a man who's been a part of a lot of different sports throughout his career. So without further ado, let's get into the show. Okay, so we're here with Skip Gilbert of USU Soccer. It's a pleasure to have you on today. And uh, look, I've read a lot about you and your very long career in the world of sports. However, now you find yourself at the top of USU as their CEO. And uh, I was wondering if you could just, you know, tell our listeners a bit of information about your background and how it's kind of led you to where you are now. Sure. Well, thank you, Justin. Great to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Um, yeah, I've had a I've had a great career. Um, and I underline the, the word fun, which is something we want to inject into more of the, the player experiences. But most of my career has been within the Olympic movement. Um, you know, I was the chief marketing officer for USA Swimming, chief executive officer for USA Triathlon. Um, I was the managing director of pro tennis for US Tennis and manager of the US Open. So it, it enabled me to really Kind of get up to speed with a lot of different disciplines within the world of sport that that you need to do, to have to really oversee a sport. So, and of course, having a background in soccer, having played at all different levels, um, you know, it's nice to kind of get to this point where I can start to give back to the game that really treated me well and gave me all the tools that allow me to do what I do on and off the field. Skip, tell us a little bit more about your soccer career. I know that that's. Uh... It may seem like eons ago uh, when you were a kid and starting to play, but I mean, I think that's where a lot of leaders in sport start is as an athlete. Uh, so give us a little bit more about your childhood, where'd you grow up, and then your experiences with soccer. Sure. No, I grew up in New York. Um, I went to a prep school in New Jersey, and that's really where soccer started to take off. And as a matter of fact, I think I turned the page when I was a I think a sophomore in high school and the, you know, being in a prep school, your parents get a report card, not just on your grades, but also on your, the, the teams that you play with. And at Thanksgiving, I, my parents asked me to sit down at the dining room table and I thought, Ooh, maybe my grades aren't quite as good as I thought they were. And they pushed the piece of paper across and it was my report card from the JV soccer coach. And he said, and I'm a goalkeeper. And he said, Skip has absolutely no regard for his own personal safety. And I thought, that's it. I'm a keeper. And, you know, off we went. So uh, played through high school, played at college, had a great co collegiate career, a two-time All-American and, you know, that sort of thing. Played with the Tampa Bay Rowdies, uh, was able to play on one international tour with the U.S. Olympic kind of the development team before the 84 games and um, at that point if you know U.S. soccer history that 83-84 time frame is when the NASL folded and there was a void of, of top level professional soccer so at that point I tried to do some semi-pro and whatever I could find but made the decision my parents had put way too much money into my education to be playing soccer for a hundred dollars a week and so I went off to New York City and uh, found a, a job in publishing, and that's where I got going. And Skip, I mean, you had a lot of different publishing jobs from Tennis Magazine, Adweek, uh, Zip Davis, and then eventually you spent nine years uh, at Sporting News, where that really was the first part that launched your career. Was there anything that you learned working there that really helped launch and take you on to your next uh, kind of roles? Because you did then move on to the USU Soccer Federation, and that eventually led finally to USA Swimming. Yeah, no, I mean, I, on the sales and marketing side, I think what that gives you is a firm understanding that it doesn't matter what role you have in your company, you're in sales. And so it, it helps to teach what you say, how you say it, and how you present things really matters. So, you know, and I, as a matter of fact, one of the stuff, when I was at USA Triathlon, my first day there, 
you know, in, in meeting the entire staff, I had said, you know, how many of you are in sales? You know, and one person put their hand up and I said, no, no, actually you all are in, you know, and because, and even, and I said the same thing here at U.S. Youth in the sense that we all have other lives. We go out, we talk to people and they'll say, what do you do for a living? Why should someone play soccer? Where should my kid play? If they know where you work, why should my kid be involved in soccer? And the more you can articulate the story and the rationale behind the story in a concise viewpoint, uh, you know, it really helps carry you forward. And so again, that was a, that was a great learning point for me. And, you know, my days at the Sporting News, because it was, it wasn't Sports Illustrated, you know, it was the Sporting News. And if anybody knows what that was, it was almost a newspaper weekly. Uh, it was called the Bible of Baseball. It had box scores and things like that. And it was really the, the magazine for the diehard sports fan. Um, and having to tell that story and having to compete against Sports Illustrated, you know, really enabled you to, to you know, kind of focus your craft on what works and, you know, how you present the story so that someone will buy into what you're saying. It's great to hear uh, those types of journeys and pathways. But one thing that's really clear is the amount of passion that comes out of it. And, you know, you can feel that energy. It's, it's as if you're still playing the sport because that's where it all starts. Right. And, and so talk a little bit about, you know, how important when you talk about sales and the messaging and how you do that, you know, how you deliver those, those messages, what, how important is it to be passionate about what you do or to be, I guess, uh, in some ways, uh, um, not transparent, but almost have that intrinsic value because of the, the passion, right? You, it, it, you exude the passion. And so people hear that message and they're more maybe apt to understand or pay attention to what you're doing. Sure. Well, a longtime friend of mine, an industry executive used to be on the brand side. He helped do all the sports marketing for uh, General Motors. And he said, if you think about my job, my job is to say no, you know, because the minute I say yes to a sponsorship activation proposal, I have to do more work and I'll have to cut things out of the budget or find budget. So when you come in to sell, just know that I'm going to say no, unless you give me an incredibly compelling rationale as to why General Motors or any of their brands should align with what you're trying to sell. And so, you know, again, that was a great lesson early on that, you know, when you're talking to someone on the other side of the desk, if you're just very robotic and say, oh, we're doing this, we do that, thanks for listening, there's probably not a compelling reason for that individual to buy. But if you can really elaborate on the passion of what that relationship will bring to the table, they start to believe it and they start to see themselves, you know, almost in that role of, of activating on site, you know, and what they're going to do to bring, you know, a, a Chevrolet and U.S. Youth Soccer together to be able to form that partnership. Because at the end of the day, they want to sell cars and they want to sell cars to soccer families. And so, again, if you hit all of the right metrics for them, but you say it in a, such a, a, a terminology that they really believe what you're saying, it, it separates you from everybody else. That's awesome. Skip, you, uh, you've been in office now with USU Soccer for going on four years now, right? I mean, it's just coming up to that time. You, you took office at a, a re very interesting time right before the pandemic hit. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, what you, you, you took the job, uh, you came into the position, then all of a sudden the whole world shuts down. How as a leader in that position, you know, talk a little bit about your experiences and how that mindset um, trickled down into the membership. How did you rally the troops, so to speak? You know, it was interesting. In December of 2019, I was in with the board going through the final interviews, you know, and I like to joke that they didn't ask me, what would I do when the world shuts down? You know, that wasn't a, an interview question. And sure enough, you know, two months later, systematically, we had to start closing things down. And as a matter of fact, what was, I, I think, probably a telling, a telling issue for me was it was third weekend in February. I think the NBA was about to shut down. We were 
having a showcase in Las Vegas. And that was the first event to go. And I noticed that we were kind of in front of it where a lot of events hadn't been canceled, but certainly once we came out and said, our showcase in Las Vegas was an ODP showcase is going to be shut down. Everything started to fall. But what was interesting is that while we were going through that process, I got a call from a, from a mom in Hawaii who said, we're hearing that the pandemic, that, you know, this, this issue is coming in the United States and we're about to put all of our team and my son on an airplane to go to Las Vegas. What do I do? Yeah. And I think she was also amazed that, you know, I mean, quite frankly, that she got to my office, but yeah. <laughs> I said, ma'am, get your kids off that plane. And the, you don't really think about the impact of that until you hear her reaction go and, and the gratitude that she have be had because, you know, she thought that she might've been putting her kids in harm's way and, and the teammates in harm's way. And the note I got after the fact of, you know, just how incredible it was that we were able to stop her from putting her kids on that plane uh, meant everything to them. You yeah. Know? And, 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 and the so, financial impact too, right? Yeah, I mean, the just finan- everything. yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, if you, if you play it out, what if they had gotten to Las Vegas, gotten, they could, they might not have been able to get a hotel room. They might not have been able to fly home. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things that in the mechanism of all of the steps that we were taking, from then on, it was just one small step, but you think the impact that you have, you know, is, is rather significant. So that kind of set the stage for us to make sure that everything we did moving forward was at the utmost kind of protection of the players, you know, to make sure that safety came first. And we all know that, you know, as players, you know, if something comes up and you don't really know the full extent of it, you're like, oh, it's no big deal. Let's go out and play. What's the what's the harm? Um, in this case, we really did have to shut everything down, you know, that's, and it's a good thing we did. That's such a great, um, you know, comment, too, because as athletes and, and to have the perspective, right, when we look back, I mean, all we want to do is play. And often we'll put ourselves in harm's way. And certainly, you know, there's coaches and there's administrators that also carry that mentality moving forward. But at some point, uh, there's a switch as an administrator in your chair where you have to have that safety first mindset. That's been something that we've talked about a lot on some of these episodes where, um, you know, making the transition from being a former athlete and now how do we carry that into our lives today? What do we do with that today? Um, where, where along the way do you feel safety first was a mentality that kind of drifted away from sports, especially youth sports? Is that something that you felt was, uh, you know, at least a, a thought in the head and then, and then kind of drifted away at some point where the competitive side took over? You know, I'm not sure. I mean, I'll go back to even when I was playing. Um, I don't think anybody ever thought of it. You know, I mean, it was just, okay, if you got hurt, Man, that's part of playing right. and, you know, get yourself up, you know, put a bandaid on, get back out onto the field. Um, and they didn't think, you know, whether it was, I mean, even back when I played, you know, the concussion protocols, for example, no, I mean, it, you kind of come off the field and you're like, yeah, coach, I see two of you. Great. Get back in, you yeah. know, but that was because there was no scientific research to say that there was something wrong. And so I'm not sure we actually stepped away from protecting. I think it was more of an awakening that with the the in the advances in science and the advantage in medical and technological care, that we started to put the dots together to say, oh, this kind of leads to that. And if you get a concussion, you might not want to play the next because that could lead to this. And so with so much you know, information now at our fingertips, it made it a lot easier to say, all right, how do we now protect kids from getting, you know, to that, that extreme point that they may not be able to come back from. And this is a position that uh, USU soccer right now is actually creating. And that's as a response from the U S soccer Federation, correct? That's a, a new focus and a specifically an office position that's going to be held by the, uh, the national governing body. Is that correct? Yeah, we launched a search for our director of HR compliance and participant safety um, just before the Yates report came out. 
you know, we had an inkling that, you know, one that was coming, but even still, as we, as we came out of the pandemic and as we, you know, saw everything coming together, you know, even again, before that issue, we knew that participant safety, you know, had to have a very focused approach to it. Um, and so, you know, now we're, we're coming out, we're, we're in the, in the uh, interviewing process, but that's going to be, you know, a very important piece of the puzzle because with 54 state associations, we want to make sure that it's a very high level standard of, of care, if you will, across every aspect of what we do. Sports are in full swing 24 seven, which means athletes are bound to get injured. Injure Free is a software platform used by youth sports organizations and schools that was developed to help coaches, parents, and administrators communicate injuries that occur and ensure a safe return to play. These sports safety networks are essential for sports teams working to provide the safest possible environment for their families. For more information or to schedule a demo, please visit www.injurefree.com. That's www.injurefree.com. And now, Skip, you kind of refer to it as an awakening, more or less, for the sport environments to just understand how players' health and safety really is taking a leap in development from looking at data and analytics. But do you see that there's anything that you guys at USU Soccer in general have added to whether it's a knowledge curriculum for uh, coaches or athletes themselves to really increase the awareness of how to keep an athlete safe? You know, that's a great question. And and about a year and a half ago, we launched something called USYS University. And the whole idea of that was to become a community resource center for the youth soccer ecosystem. Um, again, not just for USYS, but really for anybody within youth soccer. And it was you know, when you think about USYS University for a sport, you think X's and O's and it's coaching, referee, education. But for me, it's more of a community resource for on and off the field. And, and our real focus has been the off field care. You know, we we created a partnership with True Sport out of the U.S. anti-doping. And that's all character development. You know, how do you deal with you know, with uh, success and failure and all the different things that make you, you know, a real strong, not just professional, but, you know, a, a, a real strong individual. We were, we're teaming with um, the U.S. Center for Mental Health coming out of the pandemic and the issues that kids are having from a mental health and the awareness and almost the awakening of so many mental health issues, being able to have that resource. The Hospital for Special Surgery not to go to find where you can find a doctor to carve into your knee, but with muscular skeletal care, what steps, what steps can you take to ensure that you don't have to be in front of a surgeon, that if you start to tweak your knee, you know, these are the things to look for and these are the things to do. So when you, you know, and then better parenting, um, you know, that group is helping to create awareness of the behavioral changes that we need to have on the sidelines and on the field against the referees and almost against each other. You know, it's, it's not so much, you know, we we've come out of a, it's almost a society of, of almost a combative approach, you know, instead of trying to talk things through or just shaking it off, it's almost trying to get in your face and, and making your point to the, to the point where you just walk away going, yes, well, that's not really the idea. The, the whole point is, you know, you, you play a game, it can get incredibly intense and get very emotional, but it should never be what comes out of your mouth. It should, or, you know, a, a, an act of aggression against a player. It should always be solved by, you know, ultimately winning the game. It's amazing. I think, uh, you know, looking back, I now have two daughters. My my girls have started playing. We had we had our first rec soccer season last year, and um, you know you heard these stories about the behaviors on the sideline and how people treat referees. My my oldest girl's uh, just turning ten, so now uh, we were in uh, we were playing seven v seven, and a lot of time the referees were fifteen years old, and still there were parents and or coaches, you know, uh, addressing them as if they were a, a grown adult 
and the decisions they were making were personally going to impact their futures or financial. It was, it was crazy to see how these people, you know, and, and I, and I get it. I mean, everybody's out there, you want your best for your kid and, you know, but understanding the understanding of what sport is supposed to bring loss is part of that. How do you deal with those failures? Just like the successes and it. That's such the valuable lesson that you can, that sport can bring. But the way you talk about you sports and the issues that you're addressing now, especially with US uh, YS University, um, I don't know if a lot of folks really put thought into how much you sport can impact our culture and health as a nation. I mean, there's what, 45 million kids playing sport every year. And, and when you look at the statistics, that's about two thirds of the population between the ages of six to 18. So if we're going to solve some of these problems, or at least make a dent downstream, youth sports is a great place to deploy a lot of these mental health uh, wellness interventions, um, education about the uh, how the body works, the musculoskeletal type of stuff. I mean, it's such a wonderful spot. So it's great to hear that you guys have this vision for what we can do with the platform that USYS has and the membership that are driving. How do you see that, you know, uh, from the membership at this point right now, do you feel the tide is shifting? Do you feel that there's a carrot and a stick? I think we're, we're slowly getting there. You know, I mean, I, I go, what you were talking about on the, on the behavioral side, you know, I, I, and the fact that so many kids play sports. If you think about it, there is certainly a scientific correlation between not just playing sport, but for kids being active and getting good grades, you know? And so that's why, you know, part of our charge is also not just, hey, let's get soccer into schools, but it's also, let's make sure kids are active. You know, for me, when you're under, if you're under, you know, teenage, you should be playing as many sports as you possibly can, you know, because again, it helps the muscular skeletal body to be able to adapt. It, it, it does a number of different things, but we have to have that. And the behavioral switch now that we're seeing on the sidelines, you know, I liken it to, can you imagine being in a classroom setting and having parents line the back wall, kind of telling their kids, lift up your pencil, go over here. And if a teacher hands the student a C, the parent unleashing on the teacher that, how could you do that to my kid? Da, 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 da you know, they'd be, they'd be escorted out of the classroom in handcuffs, but there is no problem whatsoever for those parents to have that outburst on the sidelines, you know, or the player or the coach. And so we've, we've got to somehow get that message back across that, you know, sport is a game. And as much as, you know, I mean, I've, had a good career and as much as I was aspiring to to take it to the absolute top level at the end of the day I knew it was a game I was having fun and at one point sure I was getting paid to have fun you know right. how cool is that yeah. but ultimately it's a game and I think sometimes we lose sight of that as parents and I I've, I've been guilty of it you know you you start to say something you're like Ooh, you know got to close can't do that yeah not many youth sports administrators began their careers with the dream of negotiating insurance rates. Most have the love and passion for the game and saw it as a way to inspire the next generation of youth athletes. However, nowadays insurance can be the single greatest cost for a youth sports organization. At American Sports Insurance Services, we've done the work for you and created the single most comprehensive youth sports insurance program on the market. We did it by aggregating the largest youth sports injury database in the world. Let us do the heavy lifting and represent you for all your risk management needs. For more information or to get a quote, visit www.getamsys.com. That's www.getamsys.com. It's funny. I would argue that the uh, scenario you play out there with this with the school systems actually does happen. <laughs> Maybe not necessarily in the classroom, but I, you know. I, I know enough parents to know that there's that that's definitely happening with their grades as well and how they're teaching their kids. But I guess that's more of a cultural and more of a, you know, a larger issue. And again, it's such a great opportunity for us to affect so many of these issues within sport. It's such a powerful message. It, it is different in the U S though, because of the governing body structure. 
and we we silo our sports as opposed to having a an umbrella that could govern all sport and maybe even impact some of these types of cultural um you know norms or the rules of the game doesn't matter what sport you're playing um do you see that as a limiting factor or do you see that the channel that you've been provided within soccer allows you to focus and even enrich that environment at a deeper level you know it almost it comes back to sports in the united states it's more like a du do do it yourself a diy category you know if you look at any other country they usually have a ministry of sport and that's the governmental agency that oversees all of the development from the grassroots up of what happens in that country and the government will invest in that in the United States, we don't have that. The highest level is the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, but they don't get funding from the government, unlike every other country. And so realistically, the only way to get that funding is to do it yourself. And so each of the siloed NGBs, each of the sport organi organizing bodies, you know, for them to be able to raise funds, they really need to go out, you know, and go door to door selling and, and do it on their own. And so it it's it's sort of a, a devil and a curse you know i mean the downside is that every sport would love to have millions of more dollars to be able to create more of that that base of the pyramid programming uh, but on the on the flip side it kind of makes you look in the mirror to see what is it that we truly need to do to drive our own relevancy and if we are relevant then we're going to have a connection that you know, and again, it goes back to our vision, bringing communities together through the power of soccer, making lifelong fans of the game. If we're relevant, you know, the goal for us and the goal for me is not necessarily to have kids that are national champions, and we do, but the goal for me, as a job well done, is when kids leave the youth realm, they get into their 20s, and they're still connected to soccer. That's a win. Now, Skip, you basically uh, went on actually Greg Olson's podcast, Youth Inc., and actually talked about this same matter about how, you know, the differences between the U.S. and Europe and the pathways that there can be, especially for soccer, along with other sports, but in soccer that it's so vastly different due to the fact that there are so many more sports in the U.S. that have a higher predominance or popularity factor, such as basketball, football, and even baseball you've gone on saying that that can dilute the market for soccer athletes that come in and look at you guys, you know, and say from a young age, I want to play soccer and nothing else. Do you see that, you know, since joining USC sports that you've tried to make an impact and increase the trend of athletes that choose soccer over any other sport in particular? Sort of yes to all. Um, you, you, the, the bottom line is that, it is a very fractionalized marketplace in the United States at the youth sport level. You know, every sport is in a silo. In soccer, it's even worse, where soccer is siloed in itself. I mean, there's us, AYSO, SAY, USSA, US Club, you know, all really good organizations. But what ends up happening is, is that there's more of a competitive body. There's a more competitive feel to pull kids away from other lanes to bring them to yours than there is about what's the overall developmental pipeline to be able to ensure that the kids get to the right position or more importantly, that they stay involved in the sport. And I think one of the reasons why kids leave soccer so early is that they don't think they fit. They don't think that they belong. They're not good enough. They're not having fun. They're not playing with their friends because there's such a fight for players at the top of the pyramid that people almost forget, you know, 90% of the kids just want to go out and have fun. And if we're not, if we're not supporting that, that kind of thirst for soccer at just the fun level, you know, we're, we're missing the mark. What are some of those numbers off? If you, if you have them off the top of your head, when you look at the age demographics, where does rec soccer really begin to die off? kids moving away from the game for the, you know, just for the recreational component of it all. It ideally it should be in that. Well, I mean, ideally it's when they go to high school, you know, after when they go to college, then rec soccer yeah, goes off, right. you know, and, and I've often said recreational soccer should be positioned as the developmental pipeline 
for collegiate club soccer and collegiate mm -hmm. intramural soccer. And so that there's a continuum so that you can see that you can play youth, you can play in college, you can play adult, and you can just keep going. But now, because there are so many different acronyms out there all saying that our, you know, our elite, our elite, our elite is the best, that kids are starting to leave earlier and earlier and earlier because you're seeing the professionalism of sport down to the eight year old mark. Yeah. And so it used to be you know, 10 years ago, you might've been 13, 14, where you saw the dip, you know, now it's getting to 10, 11. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, when I go into meetings with, with my old colleagues from other NGBs, they've said often that we love soccer. And I, I kind of smile. I say, well, why? And they say, well, because you get everybody playing soccer at six. By the time they're 10, you've either burnt them out. They're not having fun. They're, you know, they're not playing with their friends or they just don't think they're good enough. They come to our sport and we keep them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and I, of course, at that point say, well, I am competitive. That's going to change. Um, and what ends up happening though, is it is driven what I would call the need for alternative programming. Because again, if you're a 12 year old kid by in today's world, you pretty much know you're probably not going to, you know, play for, you know, X, Y, Z pro team. But if there was a reason for you to stay in the game, you probably would. So, you know, 11 v 11, two practices a week might not really do it for you. But if you could play 3v3, 5v5, 7v7, you know, I mean, if anything, the phone today has and technology has told us that you get what you want, when you want it, how you want it, where you want it, why you want it. Well, sport needs to be the same thing. So if kids don't want to play 11 v 11, but they want to just go out and kick with their friends, we should have an environment that allows them to go out and play 3v3, 5v5. And if we don't have that, we really can't be disappointed that they leave because that's their choice. And so it's it's opened up this whole kind of mindset that we need to be able to offer two different things. And again, I use all of the other sports as glaring examples that they've changed, we haven't. You know, you look at basketball, same problems. So they came out with 3v3. It's now an Olympic sport. Hockey, yeah. same problems. They came out with pond hockey. That's doing phenomenally well. Football, actually the exact same thing, except it wasn't those issues that I've talked about before. It was concussions. Right. So what does USA football do with the NFL? Flag football. Flag football. And not only are boys going to it, but girls at an alarming rate are going to flag football. You know, and so you see all of these sports changing. And as a matter of fact, I, I talked at uh, New Jersey's AGM and I, I was talking about this very subject. And I even flashed NASCAR as an example of change where, you know, the NASCAR audience is getting so old that they're afraid that, you know, they're going to be irrelevant in another 10 years. So what do they do instead of have the same, the same thing as always, they put a NASCAR race in the LA Coliseum, mm -hmm. you know, and that's designed to bring a younger fan base, you know, not participants, although maybe they're trying to get more drivers, but what you see is that everybody is trying to adapt and change. You know, and I, I sat with a, a technology company a couple of months ago and they said, Quite frankly, if in the last two years you haven't changed everything you've done to, in your approach to technology, you're going to be so irrelevant, you're going to be replaced. Well, if you take that mindset to technology, you also need to take that mindset to your core programming. And, you know, 11 v 11 is going to be here forever. And it is the, you know, what we want soccer to be. But, you know, where's the shoulder programming? And we yeah. need to develop that. Hi, my name is Charlie Wund, and I'm the CEO and founder of the Agency for Student Health Research. When I started the company over a decade ago, I aimed to help reduce injuries within youth sports. Since then, Injure Free was created as a risk management software platform and has grown to become one of the leading injury reporting platforms used by thousands of athletic organizations and schools nationwide. Our expansive education library and reporting technology provides the tools administrators need to take the pain out of risk management. As a former high school athletic director and youth sports organizer, I understand the regulatory compliance requirements and need 
for individual accountability. Our goal is to provide a service that does better than checking the box. For more information or to schedule a demo, please visit www.injurefree.com. That's www.injurefree.com. So this is, you know, it, I mean, I got to ask a hard question. I mean, here you are sitting as a CEO of USU Soccer, and it's clear you're very opinionated. I mean, I, I have to agree with a lot of what you're saying. So, but, I mean, what's stopping you from making these changes? Why, why can't USU Soccer begin to implement these types of programs? Or is USU uh, Soccer University kind of that first step into this world where we start to educate? It's, it's a progressive step because the, the big issue is – you know, with a with a club format and the teams of today, they register with the state association and then they move through their path. If we create just a 3v3 go play when you want, how do you stay connected to those kids? And so in one sense, sure, just go get the environment and let them play. But again, from USYS's perspective, we'd love to make sure that we stay connected with them so that we become a support mechanism for anything they need in the sport. And the question is, what does that model look like and how can we do it? And it's not in today's world, you know, since, you know, as I'd said before, there's sort of that awakening in today's world, you can't expect, you know, a bunch of kids just to go down to a field and play 5v5 or 3v3 and interchange because of safety. You know, you have safe sport issues and then you have, you know, th those legal issues that you don't want to get involved with. But you have so you're going to have to have some sort of a pseudo formalized program in order to be completely unprogrammed. The structure. And so it's a it, it it's it's an interesting concept. And I'm hoping that by talking about it enough that a number of clubs around the country will say, you know what, let's take a field and create that the free play field. And can we organically grow this concept so that the clubs see the benefit in it, they understand it, and they actually promote it? Because then we really don't have to do, you know, much oversight at the local, local, local level. It can right. be done organically. And yeah, if we you, can do that, it's successful. You, you can't manage, uh, you know, every 3B field on the in the country, right? So, so it's the out of the box. How do you create the, and it's almost, I and mean, when you boil it down, you're talking about safety, but it's a risk management infrastructure that needs to be deployed because, again, mostly volunteer driven, uh, in the, especially at the grassroots level, many of these individuals are just parents who have no background in any of this information, a way to be able to say, here's what you need to get started this creates the infrastructure and then build upon that with the fun of the game. Um, and that makes sense. Yeah, it, and it does. And again, we also have to be very cognizant that it's not going to replace the pay to play model because again, without that programming, you don't, the sport will, will just erode because you still need to be able to have that infrastructure where 11 v 11, you know, at the older age group succeeds so that you, you know, you have to pay for the field, you have to pay for the coaches, you have to pay for the referees, your travel, you know, all of the things that go with organized soccer absolutely is, is, you know, we just want that to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but we don't want a, you know, it, we, we don't want that, that sort of cavern in between where it's either all or nothing. Plus, a lot of kids develop later, right? I mean, uh, you know, it, it, maybe they play rec soccer and they don't they don't grow into their bodies until they're 14 years old. When all of a sudden now they shoot up, they're one of the biggest, fastest, strongest kids on the field where that those club environments are going to look for them. But if we lose them at 10, then they're never going to have that opportunity. We're going to we may miss some of those best the best athletes in that particular game because of the way the structure weeds them out in a way. And, you know, and again, you know, if you could get a uh, an NFL free safety you know, to, to play soccer, you know, could that, you know, that kind of an athletic build, what might imp what impact might that have? I mean, again, not taking away from any of the players today, but I go back to my my tennis days and um, my first U.S. Open, I'm standing at mid mid court with our chief medical officer and Andy Roddick, great American player, is warming up. And I look at Brian, I said, why aren't the men top five? 
And he said, well, you know, you tell me. And, and of course, you know, the women were with Serena. I mean, we're, you know, yeah. number one, just like in soccer, but the men just couldn't get up to that level. And he said to me, you know, you're watching Andy. You tell me, why aren't we top five? So I looked at Andy and I said, well, backhand, forehand, you know, his warming up as he was doing, he's probably one of the best tennis players in the world. He goes, yep. What are you missing? And I looked at him and I said, well, he's not a world-class athlete. And he goes, bingo. He goes, Andy's a great athlete, great tennis player. Right. When you think of the top five, Djokovic, Murray, Nadal, Federer, you know, those guys grew up playing soccer and running track. And then they took to tennis. Andy only played tennis. So when you look at a guy like Novak Djokovic, he could go from point A, point B, right. and over to C before you could blink. And if you watch him, he is one of the most amazing athletes I've ever seen. And he, what he is able to do, but it's because he built that base from the from the ground up. But if you think of someone like that, a free safety, who has all of these skills, today he couldn't ever go to soccer at 15. But if we had that alternative programming, a kid of that of athletic ability might take the soccer so that at some point by the time they're 18 or 19, they could have an impact. Yeah. And again, it's or what opportunities are we losing by being so closed? Yeah. And it's not keeping the kids in the sport. It's not saying that we want you to stay as a pathway from eight to 18 and beyond. It's allowing the athletes to move in and out. Uh, and come as they go, depending on where they are and what they, you know, what their what their friends are doing, what they enjoy doing, right? The the basic principles of it all. That's fascinating. It's it's, it's interesting. I was talking um, years ago with a bunch of coach friends, you know, and we we're talking about you know what kind of the, the type of kid we would love to coach. And I always said that you know you could give me you know twenty kids that had no skill whatsoever, but had the heart of a champion that wanted to play, wanted to learn. And I take those kids in a second because you can always teach skills. You can teach tactics, but you can't teach heart and you can't teach emotion, you know, and those are the kids that you can shape, you can mold, you can, you you know, they'll learn and then they will go off and, and do great things. So, you know, that's what we need is, you know, we need to be able to capture those with the passion and the heart and make sure they stay connected to our sport. And I think that that's a really interesting thing to actually uh, bring up because, you know, you mentioned the idea that these are the players that you wish you could coach would be the ones that are kind of like the dreamers that have the goal to reach the highest level, even if they don't have the skills that they have that passion. And it's funny you mentioned that because you almost uh, a decade ago um, had a great quote about how your former uh, commissioner, David Baker, at the uh, Arena Football League would say that you guys and whoever is in the business of sports has the ability to make dreams come true. So at USU Soccer, for those athletes that, you know, like you said, may not see themselves having the ability to make it all the way to the highest levels and you don't want to lose them, how do you make their dreams of even just playing for fun or with their friends continue to progress? You know, it's all about managing expectations. You know, again, whether it's a player whether it's someone that's, uh, you know, in business on a career path, you know, you want them to be able to see where can they go and what can they do. And as long as they feel a part of something, you know, as long as they feel like um, they're going to get something out of it, then they're going to stick with it. You know, and, and again, when you have millions of kids playing soccer, you know, the fight to be the best 11 to represent the country, you know, is going to be incredible. And you're going to get some incredibly talented kids. But when you get down to the 5, 10, 15,000 mark, you know, again, how do you keep them involved? Well, you know, everybody says soccer is a lifestyle. And if you have that passion for the sport and you understand how to win and lose, you know, you know, you're, you may not get to where, you know, you ultimately dream about, but you're still willing to go out and play. And again, that's, that's sport, uh, you know, that's any sport, you know, and, and it's the same in business. You know, there are some that are, you know, there are some of us that are really lucky to be able to get to the top of the pyramid. Um, and then there are some that want to get there, but can't, or some that don't even want to get there, 
you know, but at least by managing their expectations, you're going to get, you know, the most out of everybody. Skip, you know, you've done a great job of really painting a picture, I think, for a vision. It's one of the things we always like to ask is where do you see, you know, your sport or where do you see the opportunities? Um, but I think you've done a great job of painting that picture for everyone about, you know, where you'd like to see you soccer and, and what that vision is. And, I, and quite frankly, I think it applies to any sport, like you've been saying, is that these are the basic principles. But what are your what, what's one thing right now about USU soccer? What's one of the things or maybe just soccer in the United States? that you'd like to see changed? Uh, and if you could snap your fingers overnight, what's that one thing? And I know that's going to be hard to narrow down, but maybe we'll, we'll, <laughs> we can open it up to maybe two, maybe two or three things. But if you, could, if you could pick one thing and just say, this this has got to be you know done with, what is it? Wow, good question. Um, you know, what we've been talking about, I mean, if I could snap my finger and suddenly have a mini pitch in every community, you know, in the library parking lot, um, you know, of the local school, I would love to have that because if you have the base and it goes back to when I was growing up, you know, I grew up in New York, just outside of New York city, you know, on almost every other block, there was a basketball court, right. you know, and kids would just go. And how cool would it be if we now had soccer courts that kids could go and easily play 3v3 or 4v4 just to, you know, just to, to get out there and then be able to go off and, and play in their game. That would be one, you know, internally, you know, for us, one of our big priorities uh, is technology. You know, we've, we, I'm a firm believer in today's technological society. We need to be relevant to all end users, players, coaches, parents, referees, club administrators, you know, even alumni, you know, for uh, that, that they need to understand and, and, and be wanting to get good, strong soccer content to stay connected. And we just, at this point, don't have the technology nor the processes of technology to do that. And this year is going to be the start of our, you know, we're going to come out in the next couple of months with a whole new website. Look, um, our, our technology is going to change. Our content drivers are going to change. And you know, we want to be the go-to resource center for the entire youth soccer ecosystem. You know, and if, if I could snap my finger and have that done today, you know, it'd be a lot of fun, but it's going to take some time and a lot of work to get there. That's a huge undertaking when you talk about building a content management and just the connectivity of a community like that. But yeah, it's, it, it, it is. And and the, the third, you know, I, I guess the, the third, if I could snap my finger, it would be on the two sides of safety. You know, one, the behavioral changes so that every referee can, can not have to look over their shoulder when they walk off a field, um, you know, and that, that they don't feel like, you know, they're, that they're going to be threatened. Um, that's one aspect. And on the other side, I, I'd love to see a day where not one kid ever feels like, you know, from a safe sport perspective, that they have an adult that's kind of looking at them in a way that no adult should look at a kid, you know, in that environment. So, you know, if we could get both of those to transform into, you know, a, a past tense, um, I, I think that would probably be the best thing that could happen to sport in general, period. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll echo that and I'll say that's probably those are probably two basic principles in our society as a nation as a whole, just general kindness and respect for everybody and just taking care of children, making sure we've got safe playing environments for their development. So, well, Skip, I can't thank you enough. We really appreciate you being on here. This is a great conversation. Uh, we appreciate all that you do there at USU Soccer and uh, we'll work on some mini pitches. We'll try to get some mini pitches all over the country. I love it. We'll put them in the grocery stores if we can. Yeah, well, perfect. Well, Charlie, Justin, thanks very much for having me. Always a pleasure to talk about the sport. Thanks again. We would like to thank you all for listening to today's episode of the Safety Goals Podcast, presented by Injury Free. I'm your host, Justin Torres, and a big thanks to our special guest. And also, thanks to my co-host, Charlie Wund. To listen to other episodes of the Safety Goals Podcast, check us out on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts.